<clears throat> Thank you. Um, so if I speak like that, is that loud enough? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Ah, thank you, Leslie. So, you know, I chose to start um, today's talk in a way that I'm not that familiar with, um, uh, with, with the, the slide of um, Culture Declares Emergency, which is seem to me an honest place where I find myself these days uh, around my practice and my studio. Um, so I decided uh, that instead of um, completely just focusing on the trajectory of my work and, and kind of a build up, I'm going to start from where I am right now and kind of go back and talk about recent works and different kind of ways that I, I guess, tackled these um, social issues over the years. Um, I think. My work has always been concerned with production and kind of hyper-global capitalism. Um, as very much as a consumer and as a kind of, in a way, rep repelled and seduced by it. So the question of um, the place of the connection between more ethics and aesthetics or morality in art is always something that I've been struggling with and never kind of um, completely settled with the, with the answers. Or, um, I remember hearing a talk actually by Tanya Bruguera about the, and she was mentioning that her obligation was to make the best art piece rather than to make the most moral um, decision. And that resonated with me for a long time. Um, Sometimes as an artist, I feel you have to p put yourself in a position where it's morally kind of complicated in order to uh, kind of stir up issues. Uh, and I feel like I've been doing that a lot with my work, uh, in a, in, not in a position that I'm always completely comfortable with, uh, although in a position where I ask myself ethical questions and I feel like it's fine, although I, I'm kind of aware of the um, complications of that. So New York's Culture Declares Emergency is a group I started co-organizing with a few other artists. Uh, it originated in the UK, and it's an affinity group of Extinction Rebellion. I think maybe some of you heard, most of you heard about Extinction Rebellion. It's a kind of a new kind of climate action group um, that, um, and for me, starting this group was, uh, you know, I think all these, uh, Kind of climate um, groups have, uh, you know, their kind of own issues, and and but I thought that that would be some something I kind of connected with, and I felt like I want I would like to sit in a room with a bunch of other um, kind of culture uh, producers and workers and discuss. Um, not so much the symbolic uh, ways of making art, but the way that the art world operates and um, how right now, I feel like I'm in this position and maybe a bit late in the game uh, of really re -question questioning my whole mode of production and operating and the way I make shows, uh, the waste around, you know, uh, even wall building and, and kind of creating this kind of um, temporary three months kind of spectacles. And I'm a bit lucky because my work is video and I have the opportunity to, to kind of reduce and change. And it's something that I'm working on, it's changing towards the future in different ways that don't seem perfect, just seems like the immediate solution of what I could do right now. Um, these are a few of the questions that, um, the group kind of asks my, er, itself and the idea is to kind of break into action groups and that could do different things. But I, I for one, feel like it's time to deal with these uh, issues, uh, not just symbolically. Uh, it's not enough to create work about um, injustice and of uh, climate chaos and other kind of injustices and, and in the, in, within a system that 
is basically just playing the same game. Um, I don't know the solution. I don't know if the solution would be end of making art the way we're used to. Um, if, if it's worth it, if, you know, that, that way, I mean, I think that there used to be, for a while I thought, oh, art is, it's worth it, you know, it's, it's because it's art and it's almost like this kind of religion or something, it's like, but I'm, I'm questioning that and um, I don't know, I think it's, it's something that, it's, there's no solution for me, it's something that I'm struggling with and I kind of wanted to start the, the talk with that. Um, so just to kind of, and perhaps we can circle back to these questions in the end and kind of have some kind of a discussion about that. Um, so as cultural institutions, worker, presenters, and producers, is it possible to shift from a production paradigm of growth, competition, and extraction to one of regeneration, reciprocity, and circularity? Um, I think extractive economy is something that I've been kind of obsessed about with my work. Uh, I think there's always some kind of form of extraction. Uh, in the earlier work, it was extraction of one's own body or someone's own body. Um, later work became about um, extracting from nature. Um, this relationship uh, to natural resources and uh, kind of Marx's definition of labor as a process between men and nature. Um, I just read recently about uh, this idea of that there is no resources, there's just kin and kindred, which is a really interesting idea to stop thinking about things as resources uh, and thinking more about this relationship. Um, so that's for me a very valid question. Is it possible through not so much the, um, the themes of the, the, the artwork, those I think of course are completely open, but through the, the, the economy that the small art world could model, is there a way to shift from extraction to regeneration to some kind of a more circular kind of, um, kind of economy? Um, what does it mean to contribute to culture this moment and beyond? Uh, what does it mean to, to contribute to culture of, this culture of basically destruction extra and extraction? Um, how is art making positioned as a reflection of dominant culture based on inequity and exploitation towards extinction? And how can participant ma manifest under these circumstances? So, Basically, is, is critique from within even possible when you're working with a system that operates in that way? What's, is critique even valid? Um, at some point I thought, oh, I'll just make abstract, beautiful kind of um, works, small works, because maybe, maybe that's what art should be right now and not attempt to deal with these kind of social injustice issues um, since it operates from the same kind of mode of operation. It doesn't seem valid, but I don't know. I don't really want to make that kind of work. So, um, what effect does the globalized art economy have on our communities, and how, when, and why, by what means is action and resistance possible, valid, or effective? Um, one big thing is we acknowledge that we are beholden, complicit, dependent, and or implicated in these systems. Uh, so this is not an external kind of observation. You know, I, I live from this system. I think we all do. And um, in one way or another, we're all part of it. And I think that that is the big problem of how do you um, kind of break from this system that's, you know, it's destructive and it's uh, oppressive. And for some people more than others, uh, I feel like as an artist, I have some kind of control over what I demand. It's uh, uh, from institutions, for example, or uh, how do I operate my studio? You know, I think if I was working under someone else's structure, it would have been a lot difficult. But I feel like as an artist, operating a very small studio, which is basically me and some people that have been working with me on and off uh, for years, but. I don't have like a big studio with like, you know, hundreds of people working for me that I have to send home because I'm going to change uh, the way I do stuff. So in a way, I'm, I'm lucky in that way of kind of always trying to keep a very small operation that could change if I need to. Um, 
So these are the questions. This is what I'm asking myself right now. Uh, the work I'm going to show doesn't come from this place necessarily. Uh, it comes from an extractive mode of production. I think I've always tried, I think this, this kind of idea of circularity and examining the system is something that I've always been uh, very occupied with. Um, but I'm not showing these works as an example of the, how this could work. This is looking at the future. And uh, this is especially looking at just use of resources, of um, not making work that would go to cold storages and never will come out of light forever and ever, um, not you know, taking a million flights, not flying giant objects around the world. Um, right. And you know, those are just kind of the tip of things that I could um, think about. I think the question is a lot more um, complex. And you know, I also don't think that this crisis is necessarily beatable. Uh, I think it's bigger than the art world or anything else. But uh, I don't know the other way of just. I mean, yeah, we could just. I could just not care at all and just kind of keep pretending like everything is fine. Um, but um, that just feel, feel, and I've been doing that for a while, but I just feel like that just felt more and more kind of um, dishonest. So um, this, is, um, this is a piece from 2010. This is Mary Boone and Cube. Uh, this is a part of Squeeze. I'm not sure if you all know where Mary Boone spent her days these days. <laughs> um, no, not funny, I don't know, but, but yes, <laughs> but yes it is. Uh, no, I don't know. So she, I worked with her for a moment, in, uh, right around the financial crisis. So she approached me right at 2008, asking to, to give me a lot of money to make artwork, and that was, you know, a very uh, interesting proposition at the time, because um, nobody else offered me that. And I... Um, at the time, I thought that the only way that that could work if she's kind of actively part of the work. So I, I told her that as a condition. She said yes. Uh, then the financial crisis happened, and I thought she'll never give me the money, but she actually did. Um, so the, there, the work happened. Um, I'm going to show a piece of the, of the, of the video, uh, but the, the work kind of circulates around the production of an art object. I don't know if you could see that, but um, so the idea is to kind of remove the object and work just with the process of the creation of kind of a value around um, basically a compressed piece of trash that would become an art piece. The, 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 the cube, the art object, whatever I call it, was uh, composed of uh, blush, latex, and r r blush, latex and lettuce, and iceberg lettuce. Um, in the end, uh, it was made into a cube and shipped, according to the certificate, shipped to the Cayman Island to be stored in perpetuity. Um, and what is left is the video that shows the pr process of its making, the photo of Mary Boone kind of modeling the cube, and the condition report that says that it's in Cayman Island in a cold storage forever and ever, uh, it, yeah, according to the certificate, of course. Uh, the way that the piece was sold, not so successfully, <laughs> later on a little better, but uh, it was sold as, um, as stocks, basically. So nobody ever owns the, the cube. What people own is a piece of a video, one share. So this is kind of shares. One out of seven. I always own the controlling share, and then six other institutions or collectors will own the rest. So in a way, nobody can ever own it unless I sell my share. Um, so this kind of this mythology around this object, art object. Mary Boone had a bit of a hard time understanding completely that, uh, but in the end, she went for it. Um, this is. Um, about five, seven minutes of that um, screening.
um, so that's that's how the video was shown. You come into the gallery and then it looks like a, kind of a weird office extension. You go in, this is Mary holding the cube. And that's that. A little bit of a background piece. Of, um, I started thinking about um, stocks and, and kind of trade and creation of, kind of value. It is kind of inflated systems uh, that are kind of like a game around value. and. I had happened to have a conversation with this guy that was iceberg lettuce broker, and I was really fascinated by this. Um, oh, wait, it's going to some light. Um, curious about his job. What does it mean to be an iceberg lettuce broker? And he said it's a very stressful job, and you constantly have to adjust the prices of iceberg lettuce according to the weather, according to the truck condition, road um, conditions, and so forth. Um, so he sits in Salinas and constantly kind of buys and sells iceberg lettuce, which are basically these kind of green bowls of water. Um, so I was interested in this like whole kind of complex system around these things that kind of have they require a lot of water, but have no kind of real nutritious value and are mostly coming from the Imperial Valley in California, uh, kind of shipped constantly all over the world and kind of monitored by these people that are stockbrokers for iceberg lettuce. Uh, so I thought there would be an interesting piece to go, to, to start through um, exploring what that means. So I, I met him in his office. I sat there for a little bit. Uh, I didn't really understand much about what he was doing. And then I kind of went around where the lettuce um, was grown and the picking, clean and pick, it's super efficient way where they're actually, there's this elaborate machines and they're picked as they're, uh, they're kind of packaged as they're picked. Um, so it's like this like moving conveyor belt. A lot of the people that pick them, they come from, it's right on the border of Calexico and Mexicali and a lot of them come um, overnight, come across the border, and then a uh, uh, time zone too. So this is actually in Arizona. So they cross the border and then a time zone to get to work every day and back. Um, and this is all lettuce that, you know, these are our sandwiches and all that. So uh, after kind of looking into, and then the piece squeeze kind of develop, developing in my head, I was also interested in um, this um, process of making lettuce, uh, rubber, latex, Basically, mostly used for condoms or pacifiers, very fine organic let, uh, um, le latex. Um, and most of it is produced in Southeast Asia. This is in Kerala, in India. Uh, these um, kind of trees are, you know, a lot of deforestation because of these trees that are kind of milked. Uh, to, to create this uh, kind of natural rubber. You might know this used to be like the kind of oil industry. Um, uh, this rubber, like rub rubber barons and all that used to be uh, this gigantic, gigantic industry. Now there's chemical rubber, so the latex is more kind of high end uh, for yoga mats, mattresses, condoms, and pacifiers. <laughs> um, this is how it's made. Um, this is the, the materials. This is um, kind of the way I think about these works. So I kind of think about them as giant kind of sculptures. So uh, trying to make sense of, uh, make a subjective sense of where things come from and how they fit together. Um, I think in this work specifically, specifically, I was thinking about an internal kind of psychological space uh, kind of combined with um, kind of a social political space. Uh, and try to kind of constant blend one to the other. So the space that um, some of the people sit in have this kind of magical ability to expand and contract and kind of respond to different kind of um, wishful thinking or uh, magical thinking. Uh, a lot of it is hot and cold, so when one character gets very hot, the, spa the whole space expands. When she gets very cold, the whole space contracts. Um, and all these kind of things arrive through there. So I think about these kind of, I don't really do storyboards, I do more like maps and I film according to that and then in the editing everything kind of comes together. Um, it's a different kind of basically floor plans or blueprints of how that works. Uh, 
um, later on in the Cosmic Generator that I'm going to talk about soon, I returned to that area. This was filmed in 2008, uh, and I spent a bunch of time around Mexicali and Calexico, and I kind of ex learned about the um, history of how the irrigation canals were built and how I think like two thirds of the U.S. produce comes from there. The irrigation um, canals were built by uh, Chinese mig migrant workers that came to build the canals, but then weren't granted um, a green card or stay visas. So a lot of them moved. They were welcomed in Mexico, so they started the biggest kind of Chinatown right on the border. Um, uh, that's why there's a very special cuisine there of Chinese Mexican food, and I was told the best lunches to, to have is to go to Mexicali, Mexicali and eat Chinese food, and I was very curious, and I went, great food, and later on, I was, became more interested in, in that region and that place. Um, this is a drawing from, I think, 2002, um, where I became very interested in uh, value, the creation of value, and I remember um, getting into Marx's theory of uh, time and labor, time and labor, and value, time, labor, and value. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm less kind of, I'm interested in Marx as kind of po a poetic writer and a philosopher, not so much in, in the work in the kind of manifesto and the like political kind of Marxist way. It's more about the idea of what really, um, what, cons what is value, what, what thinking about every kind of object that we see around us uh, as kind of holding this dead labor and, and, nature and resources and material matter. Um, and in thinking about, about these objects as, as kind of um, accumulation of dead time, basically, rather than like a, a solid object. Um, Recently, I've been more interested in, in matter and what is matter. And I think in the earlier work, it was more about the pure kind of Marxist idea of time and, and resources create that surplus value. Um, recently, I've been more interested um, in kind of new ideas about new materialisms and what actually matter is and the way that kind of matter and humans interact. Um, this is from 2002, and it's kind of, kind of a Marxist kind of way of thinking about the process of creating labor, uh, creating value through uh, the process of, of giving shape to natural resources, dividing them, monetizing, creating um, kind of um, creating units out of something that's unif unifiable. So for example, water, creating like a unit out of water, you know, and then selling it and then. Um, just different ideas of um, how 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 I can create. I wanted to create my own unit to measure uh, effort or labor, uh, kind of a subjective kind of effort or labor. Um, so I want and I wanted to create this machine that would do that. Um, I was thought, thinking about different things that kind of could come in and in, inflate um, this piece, and I wanted to work with dough because that was a very kind of bland, kind of formless material. Um, I also like the connection between idea of what dough is, you know, the kind of the play on the word dough, but also how uh, it could be almost an abstract unit. It doesn't have a color or anything of its own, so it could kind of take in all these kind of efforts and all these things and kind of be a stand-in for like a unit, like a calorie or something. Um, so this is uh, dough from 2003 or four. I want to show a little bit of that.
Um, so what's packaged is the surplus. Um, um, what's packaged is the the surplus obviously so there's always it's like this closed system and um, whatever is inflated then gets divided so it's made more goes back to the big pile and then the unit is the extra surplus that was made um, sorry this is not so uh, big um, sorry the small images uh, for these earlier works um, this was kind of early internet I became really interested in working with women that um, you know, sell the parts of their bodies that have kind of um, an attribute that uh, becomes valuable on, on, online. And I was interested in um, the kind of empowerment that they might have by kind of owning the means of production and this kind of relationship that they have with their own bodies as a way to something that they could rent out. Uh, this is Tolt Cat, she's six foot nine and she rents out her tallness. Um, this is Queen Raki, she's pretty amazing and um, she's the, um, the star of Doe. She has, um, She's retired now, but she used to um, be a squasher, professional squasher, and also be a size activist. So she has kind of two main careers. Um, they all have kind of hourly rates, and I created these kind of structures around their bodies, um, inviting them to participate, and then kind of hiring their, their services. Um, this is a video I don't normally show, but it, um, I was invited by W Magazine to create, make a photo shoot and I invited different people that I worked with uh, that use their bodies to kind of commodify their bodies in a way or use their bodies as kind of a way to grow stuff out of. Um, this is a few of the people kind of talking about their relationship with their bodies. All right. I want to try to make this bigger. Hold on.
<clears throat> Nobody was harmed during filming. <laughs> um, yeah, and this is the human floor that the guy on the floor was Pete, the human floor. He enjoys this. Um, so he says. <laughs> um, this is um, this is a way earlier piece, uh, kind of the first one that. Um, we did in 2002, that was around um, an extractive economy through the body. You can see, an it's interesting because this is a drawing for like early, like 2001, and they see that I said my extractive economy. So um, I guess it was a way to uh, think about, um, I was at the time looking at these closed circuit economies like the Amish people or the kibbutz in, in Israel and uh, thinking about creating this, um, this kind of moving factory that will package time. And I wanted to package someone's specific time that, that has a lot of time invested in their body and a lot of, kind of labor invested in their body. So I collaborated with Heather Foster, who's a bodybuilder, uh, and we kind of created this product from her sweat. Uh, it's moist tissue paper, handmade moist tissue papers. Uh, that I was interested in creating this product that she could kind of offer to her fans and I can offer as an art, um, art object uh, and also sell on eBay. Um, so, uh, and then it would actually contain her sweat that would be desirable to some people because she has many fans. Um, this is back um, to this idea of making, making a unit. Then I want to jump, as the dough unit. Um, okay, I'm not going to show this. this is quickly another um, product that um, I found on, online. So a lot of my work kind of mixes fact and fiction and found things and not. This is a hair grower a product I found online one night researching long hair. Um, I was very curious about it, and it turned to be a, a hair fertilizer made by the Seven Sutherland Sisters in 1860, so over 100 something years ago. Uh, these women were pioneers in marketing techniques. They um, basically made a product for men, a uh, cosmetic product that's supposed to grow hair. They made a million dollars in 1886, which is kind of like a billion dollars in a year today, by shaking their hair and going to drugstores and offering this hair fertilizer that was basically water and alcohol. Um, <coughs> they claimed that they put that on their hair. Um, and later on, they would hire replacement sisters, and uh, they liked to party together. They were seven sisters, never got married, apparently shared lovers. They lived in Lockport, New York. I went to their hair hometown. At some point, they stopped traveling. They hired a lot of surrogate sisters with long hair. Um, so kind of this Victorian kind of air of beauty. And, um, and at some point uh, during the 20s, you know, after they became rich and famous, suddenly there was a, the Great Depression and also long hair stopped being in fashion and, and didn't end so well 
for them. Um, but the idea is also that um, if, if this is around chemical fertilizers that became kind of uh, widely available, so uh, they grow this, the same way. If you can grow wheat so fast, you can sure grow your hair so fast. Uh, Later on, so then I decided to kind of remake their story of, of uh, kind of growing up on a poor farm in Niagara Falls, trying to kind of cultivate the, the, the earth, the ground growing, making, trying to make cheese, and at some point realizing that they uh, could make better living by kind of cultivating their own image uh, and selling that as in a bottle. Um, actually, we don't have so much time, so I'm going to skip that. Um, <clears throat> Um, this is kind of recent research around uh, Bitcoin mining. Um, so I think this kind of makes um, the, a lot of my exploration is around the creation of a value system. Um, so I've been really interested in cryptocurrency as a currency that's only energy that never actually has to materialize into anything else and just exists um, as information. Um, I thought that was so interesting and I also um, was interested in how a lot of these crypto mines, because uh, the process of, um, of extracting, making Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever coin you're making requires a lot of energy. So a lot of them kind of hug, sit by uh, recent um, um, uh, water dams or different kind of ways of producing electricity uh, uh, and, and kind of take a ton of energy and they could be made in like this homemade kind of like shack um, and kind of create mine for crypto. These are different kind of sculpture or not sculpture but Bitcoin mines, homemade Bitcoin mines. Um, the, the big thing is to cool them down basically because they, they spin really fast. This is a little bit about Bitcoin, because uh, I think it's really interesting. And also, this is uh, one of the people that invented. Um, Can you hear? I'm sorry. Yeah, so first of all, there's two questions. Ah, oh, this is Vitalik Botkin um, explaining about blockchain technology. Um, 
Also, blockchain has really interesting shape because it's kind of this organic thing, completely decentralized. So, of course, like central ba banks and um, governments are nervous about it because it basically takes away the, the place of the central bank, replacing it uh, with a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. Uh, very interesting concept. The only problem is it's crazy. Um, energy hungry so but I was told that someone found a whole cave on the moon that supposedly can harness and um, celestial energy and create bitcoins uh, so <laughs> I don't know something to look forward to uh, <laughs> um, so this is a kind of a drawing diagram around spaghetti blockchain which is the most recent piece um, where I um, started thinking about materialism. I mean, I think that um, we live in a very materialistic world. We're surrounded by stuff, materials. Um, but of course, then there's also the kind of philosophical uh, meaning of uh, the materialism, which is uh, the exploration, the, the theory of, of thinking about everything as matter, even if it's psychological or... Um, I'm not doing a good job explaining it. Marx is kind of a materialist, Hegel, um, a lot of other. And uh, so kind of thinking about where the philo philosophical idea of materialism is and wh where is like kind of a materialistic society kind of um, live together. Um, I've been more and more interested in the, this idea of, of what matter is, uh, thinking about... Uh, of this lack of separation between um, inanimate and animate. Uh, we are all, compo we are in a way matter with a little bit of intelligence, um, questioned, <laughs> questionable, but um, I started thinking about myself as kind of like a lump of, of matter and the way that we kind of, and as humans uh, interact with matter as, as if we kind of give it shape uh, and we, form it and we extract it, where in fact it's a much more kind of circular relationship and it affects us a lot more than we think that we affect it. In fact, there is no it in us. We are the same. Um, at the same time, I was interested in particle physics, the kind of, uh, from an artist's perspective, physics is really not my, my thing, but I'm fascinated by the ideas and uh, do, uh, you know, uh, complete a lot by, with my, Imagination. Um, these are a couple quotes from a couple of books that I've been interesting, interested in um, around this idea of new materialism, basically energy, I mean, agency of matter. Um, as human beings, we inhabit an electable material world. We live our everyday life surrounded by, immersed in matter. We are ourselves composed of matter. We experience its restlessness and is intransient even as we reconfigure and consume it. This is from, this is Diane Cole and Samantha Frost, Introducing New Materialisms. Another quote that I found really uh, powerful is, um, this is Jane Bennett from The Force of Things in Vibrant Matter. She's talking about uh, seeing a few pieces of trash, I think it was a dead rat, a plastic bag, or a few other objects. Um, the items on the ground that day were vi vibratory, junk that claymates, inert matter, then live wire. It hit me then in a visceral way how American materialism, which requires buying ever increasing number of product purchased in ever shorter cycle is anti-materiality. A hyper consumptive necess necessity of junking them to make room for new ones conceals the vitality of matter. Um, that idea really resonated with me. I, I remember actually having a conversation with Samantha Frost around how I always feel like uh, plastic objects are kind of hijacked. Um, and she said, oh, well, in a way they are because they're fossil fuel kind of products that are made from ancient decomposing matter uh, that then have taken out of this uh, circulation and being kind of trapped in a place where it cannot decompose anymore. So it is kind of hijacked from the, the kind of the circularity of, of its kind of essence. Um, so you could think about like ancient dead dinosaurs kind of trapped in plastics and cannot go back. <laughs> 
Um, um, this is a part of Spaghetti Blockchain, where I uh, was thinking about matter and also at the same time being um, interested in this uh, phenomena that probably you're all very familiar with, ASMR, uh, autonomous meridian um, sensory response um, videos online. Uh, my daughter has been fascinated by these slime videos. Um, so I, uh, thinking about this kind of hunger for interaction with, with material and this kind of tactileness uh, being um, kind of uh, uh, I'm flowing on the internet, but the access rate is, is through like this kind of smooth surface of the phone that doesn't, uh, so it's kind of this compensation um, of interacting with this super artificial different plastics that matter. This is a little bit of physics one-on-one -on -one for first grade, but it's pretty. <laughs> This is Richard Feynman. Particle physics. physics. The atoms are jiggling. The jiggling more corresponds to hotter. And colder is jiggling less. So if you have uh, a bunch of that, a cup of coffee or something sitting uh, on the table, and the atoms are jiggling a great deal in the corner, they bounce against the cup. And the cup then gets shaken. The atoms in the cup shake, and they bounce against the source, and the heat heats the cup, it heats everything up. Hot thing spreads its heat into other things by mere contact because the atoms that are jiggling a lot in the hot thing shake the ones that are jiggling only a little bit in the cold thing. So. Um, this is YouTube videos. <laughs> As I was researching this work and I was trying to uh, talk to different people about the ideas around it and around materiality and human relationship with nature and, and materials, it was interesting to explain the different kind of elements. Um, spaghetti blockchain is this uh, oxygen, hexagon piece, so it has kind of six elements that in a way you could say that they all have to do with humans' relationship with the material world or with um, nature. Some more, you probably know these videos, but. <laughs> and you know, I mean, I showed you though a piece that I worked in early 2000 before YouTube, um, before the most satisfying videos. Uh, and it's really interesting um, that uh, kind of, I should stop making them because these are better than anything I could make. <laughs> uh, I think though was so much about and these are called most satisfying videos, and they are incredibly satisfying. Um, and this is something, I think that our body really respond to that because we are made out of these kind of things, our bodies, that, and uh, there's something extremely satisfying um, to watch this. It's very, in a way, super artificial substances, materials, but very bodily at the same time. It feels like something I would hear inside my stomach or something. Um, so I think in a weird way, it's, it, it places us in our bodies um, because it puts us inside our bodies and we, then we feel our bodies. And interesting to think how such a removed medium, this is completely, there's nothing new, the only material is light, uh, kind of, a way is a perfect medium in a way for that. Like this wouldn't work if I had it like as like a real kind of installation. It has to go through this like mediated um, hyper real kind of filter. Um, this, is, this is spaghetti blockchain. This is all recent work that was in the new museum so maybe most of you have seen it, I'm not sure. Um, this is kind of a Bitcoin mine inside a yurt. This piece was filmed in Russia, the border between Russia, China, Switzerland, uh, and Maine. 
I really wanted to film in Russia uh, and in the U.S. Uh, and China, like the border, um, because of different reasons. I thought I, I never actually went to Russia, so I, it was kind of a social experiment. I hired um, a local crew, a crew, Russian crew. Not uh, the 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 film, the yurt and the throat singing was filmed in Tuva, which is a federation. It used to be its own country in the middle of Siberia, uh, close to the border of China. Uh, by the way, that was spaghetti blockchain. So that was a, m a model of a blockchain made from spaghetti. That's where the title is from. This is an antimatter factory in CERN, part of an antimatter. So they, they actually make antimatter. Uh, negatively charged proton, I believe. Um, and they want to know if they obey gravity or don't, not. So it's a billion dollar experiment. And in the end, in a couple of years, they're going to know if antimatter goes up or goes down, from what I understand. <laughs> and it will tell us many, many things. <clears throat> this is um, potato farming in Maine, a super AI kind of way of harvesting potatoes. It requires only one person, replaced about 100. What they don't tell you is that there's 100 people fixing the machine because it constantly breaks. Uh, so I witnessed that for a few days. Uh, there's one person to operate and constantly the dirt goes into the machine and makes it heavy and it still has weight, still obeys physics. <clears throat> so I wanted to, the um, throat singing is called Humei, and it's a Tuvan way of singing, in a way, singing to nature or communicating over great distances. Um, this is a way to kind of um, ride nature's waves and, and kind of mimic its sounds. Um, so I was interested in kind of contrasting that with this agriculture farming, which is kind of about um, kind of extracting or exploiting na nature. Um, and the, the Hedron Collider, um, which is about maybe kind of understanding nature, understanding particle physics. I know this is pretty kind of simplistic, but um, a way to, different ways to kind of relating to the forces. Um, this is Chadora Tumat. She's a Tuvan singer. Part of um, her group is called Daughter of Tuva, Daughter of Kaizi. Uh, and uh, I think I pronounced it wrong. But um, it was interesting to, to, that, to work with her uh, remotely. So I didn't want to actually go there to Tuva. I wanted to hire local crew. I couldn't find a crew in Tuva. It's a really small place. Um, so they came from, um, from Moscow. Um, and I, you know, the whole trans transaction was kind of remotely wiring them the funds to go to do it and then them sending, li sending me the footage. Um, and uh, since the piece in a way is about these kind of traveling and the particles and I thought that it would be interesting not to actually go there. And um, this is where it was filmed. It's called, this is the center of Asia. Apparently there's another uh, monument uh, in China, not too far, that also says the center of Asia. So there's a sort of debate of where the center of Asia is. Is it in Russia or in China? Um, this is uh, from Cosmic Generator. Um, this is a market, EU market. Uh, <clears throat> that's where um, I was told Christmas is made. A lot of, uh, it's a million square foot, com a small commodity market. Um, these women that work there work with the, f work with the factories and um, sell these objects all over the world. So um, they're very busy business women. When I, um, this is, uh, of a diagram around, I mean, I work with a lot of diagrams. This is one example of a diagram. I wanted to make a work that would connect between a duty-free store that I encountered on the U.S. Uh, part of the border in um, Mexicali, in Calexico, which is a California part, that would connect through the EU market into um, a Chinese restaurant in, in Mexico. Um, and 
you know, maybe think about the kind of collapse of distances and how certain objects take very quick to arrive from, um, or at that time, I mean, now it's a bit uh, maybe in delay, but, um, well, not in delay, but, um, but how, um, how some objects are allowed to travel really fast and how some people and other objects are kind of held back. So how this kind of idea of distance is malleable um, and doesn't exist in the linear kind of way of distance. Um, this is cosmic generator is actually based on Tesla's model of a cosmic generator that will take uh, cosmic energy and power um, the planet. Uh, and this is a space called that's called Unarius that kind of worships Tesla. And I took some of the aesthetics for cosmic generator from Unarius. They have amazing films um, from the 70s. Uh, this is Cosmic Generator, and I'm just open it to questions right now. <laughs> 